Blog Talk Radio. Hello, hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in again to Dr. Low Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Lauren Noel. You guys know me. And thanks for the continued support for the show. Tonight's show is all about fibromyalgia. One in 50 Americans have this condition. That's 50 million Americans. One in 50 have this. And it usually affects women from 20 to age 50. And I was doing a lot of research on this today. I saw a lot of different support groups all over Facebook and Twitter. And I was just really amazed at all the people who are affected by this condition. So thanks for tuning in. For all the, the new listeners, I was telling you, there's going to be a lot of new people listening to the show. Um, Facebook.com slash Dr. Lauren Noel. That's my Facebook. I'll try to look at questions on there. And Twitter.com slash Dr. Low Noel. And also check me out, DrLaurenNoel.com and bloomnaturalhealth.com. I want to give you a couple announcements before I introduce tonight's uh, guest. At Bloom, we're going to be doing an event. It's going to be a paleo event, all about the paleo lifestyle. We're going to have some really cool guests there with some free paleo food. And if you're local in the San Diego area, definitely stay tuned. I'm going to announce the date uh, next show, but it's going to be um, in the end of June on a Thursday. So I believe it's on the 28th, pretty sure. Um, but I'll let you guys know that date when I get that. Um, Let's see, that is actually, yep, the 28th of June. So that's going to be at Bloom from 6 to 8. So definitely check it out. Go to bloomnaturalhealth.com and you can get more information about that. Next week's show, mark your calendar, it's going to be all about addiction. That's with Pam Colleen. She's the author of the show, of the, the book Addictions. We're going to be talking about, you know, drugs, alcohol, sugar, all the different things that Americans are addicted to and what's really going on with that at the cause. So check it out. We're going to be talking about what we can do to address this. So anybody you know that's dealing with addictions, you have this you know, issue in your family, check out the show. And then the following week on Wednesday, we're going to be interviewing um, the uh, Hartwigs from The Whole Nine. We're talking about their new book. It's called It Starts With Food. Really, really excited to get a copy of that. Check that out. I've heard it's fabulous. So tune in for that. So tonight's show, all about fibromyalgia. It's really a common condition. Um, it's very, very misunderstood, and we're going to shed some light about it tonight. Joining me is, actually, he's a return guest on the show, Dr. Alex Vasquez. He's a doctor of chiropractic medicine, osteopathic medicine, and naturopathic medicine. So he's got three doctorates. He's published approximately 90 articles and letters in magazines, newspapers, peer-reviewed journals, including JAMA, The Lancet, The British Medical Journal, on and on and on. He's got many, many accomplishments, many, letter, many uh, articles. He's currently on faculty for Institute for Functional Medicine. He's adjunct professor at National University of Health Sciences, at University of Western States. He's a researcher, a lecturer. He's all around fabulous guy. To learn more about him, visit his website, optimalhealthresearch.com. For patient care, check out healgrowthrivemedicine.com. Really excited to have him on the show, Dr. Vasquez. Thanks for joining us. Hello, Lauren. How are you? Good. Sorry for fumbling Good. through that intro. I've just had a day. <laughs> No, you did you did great. I'm kind of in the same situation. For whatever reason, I only got like four hours of sleep last night. So uh, between the two of us, we'll just do the best that we can. We'll do the best we can, man. It's, it's been a day, but it's all good. You know, it's live radio. You never know what's going to happen. So I'm sure exactly. we'll have some, some fun things to talk about. So I was uh, flipping through your book today. So interesting. Fibromyalgia is a trip. It's a, it's a Man, it's such yeah. a debilitating condition. And like I said, going into different websites today and seeing these different support groups, people are really suffering. You know, they're really sure. suffering from this. And I and I want to really give honor to these people who are dealing with what they're dealing with and really thanking them for tuning in and, and hopefully they can get a lot from the show today. So um, let's just kind of jump into it. So what is fibromyalgia exactly? Right. So you know from a clinical standpoint, fibromyalgia is just a diagnosis. And uh, so obviously we make this diagnosis in particular based on certain criteria and those criteria were originally published in uh, 1990, and then they were republished and, and actually changed quite a bit for 2010. So for the 1990 criteria, uh, patients had to have at least something like 11 out of 18 tender points, and these tender points were found at very specific locations of the body. Um, and the diagnosis required that the clinician, usually a doctor, uh, would uh, perform this physical exam with a specific uh, technique, so to speak, of identifying what are called tender points. Uh, and again, these are pretty well described on the internet and they're also described in my book, but uh, usually around the shoulders, around the elbow, around the hips and the knees. Uh, so after a doctor performed an exam and excluded any other conditions, then a patient could be diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Uh, for the more recent criteria in 2010, the criteria were actually changed quite radically. and uh, 
and in some ways, I'm, I'm have, I would have to say, uh, they were changed kind of suspiciously as well. All of a sudden, a physical exam was no longer required for the diagnosis of fibromyalgia, which is very odd, uh, considering that previously the diagnosis had been based on physical exam. Uh, and the authors of the uh, 2010 criteria actually said they were trying to eliminate the need for physical exam. That just struck me as really odd, you know, because that's what doctors do, is they do physical exams. So why would we want to eliminate that unless we were trying to create a very easy way for people to get diagnosed? Um, and then, of course, we'd have to wonder why that is. Uh, and the other thing, just briefly, and we can get into more detail later, uh, if we want to, but we could always talk about something else, uh, is that the criteria became so broad, and that was another thing that was mentioned in the 2010 paper, they wanted to actually expand the number of people who could be diagnosed and expand the duration for which they could be diagnosed. So it's as if the 2010 criteria, which overrode the 1990 criteria, turned fibromyalgia from something rather specific to something that almost anybody could be diagnosed with. And consequently, you know, we see a lot, of, a lot more people being diagnosed with it. Um, so the only other thing I'll mention, and then I'll throw the ball back in, in your court, uh, is just to say that uh, I'm curious about how the drug companies have influenced some of the diagnostic criteria and a lot of the treatment protocols. Uh, a lot of the articles I've noticed are written by people who are funded by the drug companies, uh, as well as the uh, 2010 criteria were also supported by one of the drug companies. So um, I'll leave that one to you, but uh, I just wanted to point that out for the sake of completeness. But uh, basically, uh, as your listeners probably know, fibromyalgia is this pain syndrome. As you said uh, correctly before, it's usually younger women, usually between 20 and 50 years of age. Uh, it can certainly happen in men. It can certainly happen at any age. Uh, but that's the classic presentation. Uh, and these patients just have what's usually described as just this pain syndrome. So they just have widespread body pain. Uh, at least 50% of them have migraine headaches, and they've got a gas and bloating and some maybe restless leg syndrome and a bunch of other symptoms too. Um, but the primary symptom is that of pain, uh, and that's how we consider it clinically. Okay. So, so we'll get into more of the associated conditions and things that might be contribu contributing to it. So, but, but just, you know, from a conventional medicine standpoint, when a patient goes in to see their, their, their MD and they get diagnosed with this, what's usually the, the treatment? I mean, what do they have to go through after that? Well, usually they don't have to go through much. Uh, apparently, by the 2010 criteria, they don't even have to go through a physical exam, which, by the way, only takes like 30 seconds anyway. So anyway, I think that's, I think that's very suspect that the new criteria were written to exclude physical exam. It doesn't make any sense. But a reasonable doctor would do at least some lab tests to see if there's some other underlying condition, like low thyroid function, which is also common in the same population of um, young and middle-aged women. Um, iron deficiency, maybe a chronic infection, you know, maybe something like Lyme disease or some autoimmune condition like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or uh, polymyalgia rheumatica could present in a similar way. So I think a responsible doctor would certainly do some blood tests and make sure there's not some other condition. Vitamin D deficiency, as I would suspect your, your listeners are aware, can also cause widespread pain and it can certainly uh, exist with fibromyalgia, but it doesn't cause fibromyalgia, even though it causes a uh, clinical picture that looks virtually identical. So the patient comes okay. into the office with widespread pain. Doctors, uh, you know, uh, let's just say a conventional type regular doctor would probably do some type of physical exam and some lab tests, and then maybe go ahead and diagnose them with fibromyalgia, uh, at which point they get put on uh, a list of drugs. Uh, there are three drugs that are, that are so-called FDA-approved for fibromyalgia. Uh, and I'm looking at those right now, uh, pregabalin, duloxetine, and uh, milnasopram. So we can talk about those later. But usually patients are prescribed drugs once they're diagnosed mm -hmm. with fibromyalgia. Okay, so then they're put on drugs, and it's pretty much like they're going to stay on these drugs, right? It's not like it can be cured from from, from a conventional standpoint, right? Yep, you said that very well. So, yeah, these yeah. patients are put on drugs. Uh, and the new criteria were actually written so that more people could get put on drugs and so yeah. that people would have to be on drugs for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. So, and it's you know, we can really all have our really debilitating, you know. I mean, looking at these different yeah. blogs today and the things that I've heard from patients, it's that, it's that, yeah, they can still work, but they're just in continual pain while they're working. You know, they're so uncomfortable having to go through their, their daily yeah. activities, and it's, you know, my heart really goes out to them. So, 
Um, is there sure. something that can be done just, I mean, we'll get into treatments a lot later to, you know, things that can be done from a from natural medicine standpoint, but just, just about the pain. I mean, is there something that can be, that can help that in the meantime, you know, to help with that? Oh, sure. There are definitely some things that can help. Because like you said, these patients, so, you know, some people, of course, have a milder condition, but a lot of them are pretty disabled. About 10% of patients with fibromyalgia are, are disabled from it. And, you know, that's mm -hmm. millions of people. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a legitimate public health concern. Um, but as far as, like, pain relief, I, let's see, how do I want to answer this? There, <laughs> I'm actually not a big fan of pursuing pain relief. Uh, mm -hmm. What I'm a big fan of is addressing the underlying problem, uh, and then once the underlying problem is addressed sufficiently, then uh, usually these patients derive a secondary benefit of pain relief. But I think the pursuit of pain relief is exactly the problem uh, with, this, mm -hmm. with the way this condition is managed. Uh, these patients right. come in with pain. The doctor can't figure out why. They put them on drugs forever. They never try to address the underlying problem. And so these patients are medicated for the rest of their lives. Um, mm -hmm. I don't... I don't think that's good medicine. Uh, and, you know, so I, I'd be hesitant to try to do something that would be pain relieving without addressing the underlying problem. In fact, I don't, I hardly know what I would do. You know, other, of course, we can put people on drugs. That's the easy thing to do. Uh, nobody has to think that way. Um, mm -hmm. People don't have, you know, doctors don't have to think. They don't have to try to figure it out. They don't have to actually uh, read research. They just go with whatever the drug companies tell them, and they, you know, have an easy time with it. Uh, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you know, some patients might want the easy way too. And I'm, obviously, some of them, because I certainly see my share of patients who are willing to do whatever it takes to get better. But not everybody wants to change their diet and lifestyle, and so mm -hmm. they they kind of uh, succumb to the ease and and seduction of you know the drugged lifestyle, so to speak. So, but I certainly wouldn't blame them for that. The fact is. Patients choose what they think is the best option. And if they're told by their doctor that there's no cure and the best you can do is stay on these drugs for the rest of your life, then, of course, that's what they're going to pick. Sure. Um, and, you know, they're, they're told over and over again that there's no choice. And, uh, you know, an article that I reviewed on a, a YouTube video a couple of months ago uh, was exactly about that. It's about how the drug companies and the medical profession as a whole has bought into the idea that these patients need to be on drugs forever. And, you know, they... Of course, they sell, you know, billions of dollars in drugs every year. Uh, yeah. But those drugs don't address the underlying problem. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think do you think a, that a fibromyalgia, do you think it's a new disease? Do you think it's a new disease? Do you think it's been something that's been around for a while? Or is it like, you know, a disease of, you know, the 21st century? Oh, I'm sure both are correct. You know, so I'm sure that it's existed in various forms. Because uh, there are some related conditions, you know, like, there, there's a cluster of different, of different conditions, but they're very closely related. Chronic fatigue yeah. syndrome, of course, is very tightly correlated with um, fibromyalgia and uh, irritable bowel syndrome, and there's, and there's a reason for all that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd say it's probably existed for a long time, for sure, but I also think because of our lifestyles these days, it's much more common. Uh, yeah. If we were to look at the American lifestyle, it's a pretty good setup for, uh, for the uh, underlying conditions that would promote um, fibromyalgia. So, sure, I think both. It, it's probably been around, you know, forever, and it's probably more common, just like diabetes, hypertension, and cancer, and autism, and other problems are, are more common now as well because of our environment, because because of the way we live our lives. Yeah, absolutely. I know there's a big environmental component to this. So, and I guess we can get to that in a little bit. So, so just from looking at a cause standpoint, do you think this is something that is genetic? Is it something a person gets throughout their life? Is it autoimmune? I mean, what do you think? Is it an easy answer for that, or is it just kind of complex? Well, I, I'm, the, the direct answer to your question is, do I think it's genetic? No. Uh, even though I've seen some articles that might talk about a genetic predisposition, but they, those articles say that all the time. Right. And the fact is, you know, who do we have similar genes with? We have similar genes with people in our family. Well, we also tend to live like people in our family. So is it really genetic, or is it just a lifestyle, or... Um, kind of a psycho-emotional setup to then develop a lifestyle that then promotes the disease, and maybe that's what's truly in common, you know? Uh, people in the same family tend to eat the same foods and have the same attitudes towards life and exercise patterns and things like that. So, you know, it's quite possible that uh, what they're calling a genetic link is actually just a lifestyle link inherited from the family. Um, but, 
you know, we can certainly get into like some underlying causes and therefore, you know, treatments based on that whenever whenever you want to. I assume we'll do that at some point. But uh, uh, sure, there are some environmental links. Uh, but, it, you know, environment's very broad. Environment could mean infections, it could mean trauma, it could mean diet, it could mean lifestyle, and things like that. So, uh, sure, is it an environment? I mean, our only choice is, is it environmental or genetic? And I certainly think it's more environmental than genetic. And, um, but, you know, the, yeah. the drug companies certainly like to say that things are genetic because that makes everybody helpless. Uh, it makes right. the patients can't change their genes and the doctor can't change the patient's genes. So, you know, the best the most successful marketing campaign for any medication is to associate it with a gene defect because then everyone's helpless and everyone can't move and they're stuck with the, with the drug, you know, because they, they feel like they can't change their genes. And that's exactly the way that people are, are really led to, to think. Uh, and in that context, when I say led to think that way, I'm certainly talking about doctors as well. Yeah. Yeah. So a patient, uh, let's say, so we talked about that the main symptom is the of being pain but there's a lot of different things that can come along with this, with this disease. Um, what, what are some of the things oh, yeah. that a person might experience if they have fibromyalgia? Well, that, that part of that depends on which criteria we look at. If we look at the 1990 criteria, which are actually realistic, uh, patients often had gastrointestinal complaints, anxiety, depression, sleep disturbance, um, and, and migraine headaches, I think, are, of course, very common uh, in these patients. Um, but beyond that, there wasn't a whole lot. Uh, some cognitive difficulties. A lot of patients, you know, have difficulty with focus and concentration when they have fibromyalgia for reasons, in my opinion, that are quite obvious. Um, so if we go by the 1990 criteria, the associated manifestations with fibromyalgia were relatively narrow and, and, and realistic and modest. Uh, however, if we go by the 2010 criteria, which, again, are so intentionally broad, uh, that almost anybody can be diagnosed with fibromyalgia. So some of those symptoms, I'm just looking at a page from my book, uh, fatigue, waking and refreshed, cognitive symptoms, I mentioned some of those. But now they can have a lot of other symptoms. Um, mm -hmm. I'm looking at my own list here. And some of these symptoms are actually inappropriate, in my opinion. Um, chest pain, uh, I'm not too comfortable with saying a patient's got uh, chest pain due to fibromyalgia. Blurred vision. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a hard one to accept. Renaud's phenomenon? Okay. What? Now we're, now we're pushing it, you know, because typically we've looked at Renaud's as a uh, disorder of, like, the autonomic nervous system associated with certain uh, autoimmune conditions, like... So what, what's uh, Renaud's? For people who don't know what that is, what is Renaud's? Yeah, Renaud's is basically vasospasm, and I'll explain that too. It's basically vasospasm of the upper extremity. So these patients have arteries and vessels, and they're arms and hands and fingers that constrict and their hands get really cold. Uh, and that's called Renaud's phenomenon or sometimes it's called Renaud's disease if there's an associated condition or not. But these patients just have these periodic episodes of really cold, blue, white hands because they get this vasoconstrictive event. And again, vasoconstriction just means vessel, vessel tightening, so to speak. Um, but it's painful and, you know, can cause problems for a lot of people. Uh, so that's Renaud. It's kind of a, an unusual condition, but it's not really specific. It's usually been associated with autoimmune diseases like lupus and scleroderma and things like that. And now all of a sudden it's associated with uh, fibromyalgia, just to make the um, <laughs> net of people who can be diagnosed, I think, even broader. So right. let, me just say, let me just mention one or two more. Seizures is now one of the associated manifestations with Renaud, or sorry, with fibromyalgia. I think that's bizarre. That was never part of the original criteria. Uh, sun sensitivity? I, photosensitivity is classically seen with autoimmune conditions and other metabolic conditions like porphyria. So the new criteria, in my judgment, in my opinion, are so absurdly broad that it includes a lot of other conditions that should not be associated with fibromyalgia. But, you know, according to the papers, that's what's considered fibromyalgia these days. And you said that the people who make these new guidelines are connected to drug companies, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, I'll refrain from mentioning which drug companies, but one of the companies that has an <laughs> FDA-approved drug uh, for fibromyalgia did sponsor the 2010 criteria. Uh, and that's it's well published. I'm not making that up. I'm, I didn't find this, you know, by, you know, some insider information. It's published in the document. 
So, I mean, anybody can figure this out. Can figure out, yeah. let me just say, that, there, that the, the study was uh, funded by a, a research arm, a so-called research arm of a drug company. That's true. I mean, that's public knowledge. You know, so the question becomes, well, what do we do with that information? Do we, does it necessarily mean that the criteria were, you know, uh, written in some conspiratorial fashion to sell more drugs? No, it, it doesn't mean that by definition, but it certainly promotes a, a recognition that there was a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I see that conflict of interest in a lot of articles that are published convincing doctors that there's no cure for this condition and the patient has to be on drugs forever. Uh, in one of the papers that I reviewed on YouTube, uh, at, I think there were three authors of this one paper, and all of the authors were double-funded by two drug companies that, are, that have FDA-approved drugs. So it's like, well, I mean, what would we expect their conclusion to be? You know, perhaps that this is a condition that needs to be treated by drugs. Right. So, you know, people can make their own decisions. And I, you know, I'm not saying anyone's guilty. I'm just relating the facts. The facts are the diagnostic criteria were changed in 2002. It was funded by a drug company, and the criteria were made much more broad so that more people could be diagnosed for longer periods of time. Many yeah. of the review articles that are published for, for doctors, especially medical doctors, are likewise funded by drug companies. So yeah. that's, just, that's just truth. Uh, people can do what they want with it. Yeah, and I, and I know that, you know, there's oftentimes the medical doctors are so busy and they may not, they may not know this information. You know, they get the updated criteria yeah. and they just follow the criteria oh. and they, they diagnose their patients with this disease. And they're, in their mind, they're practicing good medicine and, and they're, they're being yeah. good doctors according to what the definition of a good doctor is. So from a patient's standpoint, they need to understand that the doctor might not always know this information. So you have to be your own advocate yeah. and listen to shows like this and educate yourself and really understand there's a lot more to it. You know, there's a lot more yeah, that could all. be going on with this condition. Yeah, and everything you said is exactly correct. You know, like, I've worked with some really, really great medical doctors, and one of them was the doctor I worked with in family medicine in my last uh, years of medical school. And he was, the, he was by far one of the best doctors I've ever worked with. But his hands are tied. So he couldn't even really recommend some of the treatments that we might talk about later for this condition because he works in a community health setting, and he has to use drugs that are, so-called approved and authorized through their formulary and whatever's available at a discount because it's a community health clinic. So even if he wanted to be the best doctor possible, his hands are literally tied by the system that he works in. And I'm sure the same thing is true for a lot of private doctors out there who work within these, you know, whatever they're called, health maintenance organizations or so-called health insurance groups, which don't get me started on health insurance. Um, mm -hmm because obviously it's a misnomer. I mean, there's no insurance there. Um, but, you know, a lot of doctors who work in systems like that, again, they've got their hands tied. They, they have to see so many patients in an hour, they can't figure this. Or, well, it's not that they can't. It's just their, their lives and their work environments are such that it dissuades them from trying to figure this stuff out. You know, I like doing research, and I stay up you know, late looking at research. And so I have, I have the time or I take the time or I make the time to figure these things out. Um, and um, I'm, I might say, you know, consistently proven, well, I mean, if I might say so, it would be right. You know, I published an article or a chapter in a book in 2008 uh, proposing a model for the cause of uh, fibromyalgia, and then in 2009 a research article was published by another group basically proving me right. So, you know. Don't you love that? <laughs> I, yeah, I was, I was quite pleased. And, I was, yeah. and it was, I was exactly right. It's not like I was close. It was like spot on. So, yeah, um, yeah I, was, I was pleased with that. And I, I discussed that in my uh, fibromyalgia book. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about the conventional view of fibromyalgia, the standard treatment. What's your view of fibromyalgia? My view. Uh, well, I mean, I have a pretty complex view of it. But if I were to try to distill that down. Um, yeah, I summarize it so we can go into the specifics. Yeah, so the dominant model of uh, fibromyalgia, assuming we're talking about real fibromyalgia. So we have to distinguish between the clinical diagnosis of fibromyalgia, which these days can apply to almost anyone, and because of that, it's going to screw up the research uh, because the criteria now are so broad that we're going to get a very diverse group within any study uh, for fibromyalgia. And so the results, are, the results of studies from here on out are going to be meaningless because the group will be anybody who's got chronic pain. So uh, we 
have to distinguish its current clinical diagnosis from the real disease uh, based on the earlier criteria and even before this criteria. So uh, if we talk about the real disease, we you know, could talk about some of the manifestations of it and what do we see in that condition. Um, well, we see some abnormalities in their blood, for example. We see that they have uh, evidence of low-grade inflammation. We see that they have evidence of oxidative stress. Patients with fibromyalgia tend to have nutritional deficiencies, especially vitamin D, like I mentioned before. Um, also of some amino acids, namely tryptophan, which is an amino acid uh, that's almost always been found to be low in these patients with fibromyalgia, and I can talk about that more. I'm just describing it. Um, several studies have shown that these patients have abnormalities with their muscle biopsies, and I think that that's, that is a critical piece of data to appreciate. Furthermore, when the muscle biopsy samples are so muscle biopsy and tissue biopsy samples can be analyzed in two different ways. One of, one of those ways is just looking at it under a microscope. But the other, the other way is to take the sample and then analyze it from a chemical perspective or a biochemical perspective. And if you look at these muscle biopsy samples under a microscope, uh, which are, you know, they're available in the published research, uh, these patients have very clear abnormalities in their uh, muscle biopsy samples. So that proves that this is a real disease. This is not a disease that people make up. This is a disease, it's a real legitimate disease, which is why in my book I discuss the fact that it should be called fibromyalgia, if it's going to be called fibromyalgia anything, it should be called fibromyalgia disease, not fibromyalgia syndrome, because in its true form it is a legitimate disease. Legitimate disease means you can actually see it under a microscope, you know? So they have abnormalities. One of the abnormalities uh, is they're called ragged red fibers, which is a, a defect seen in their muscle tissue. Um, and I can discuss that more later, but ragged red fibers is, is a phrase worth appreciating in this context. Um, and the other thing is the biochemical abnormalities that are seen in these patients. If you look at their energy production within their cells, it's um, abnormal. They have reduced uh, ability to produce energy in the form of ATP, uh, and they have more oxidative stress and, again, numerous nutritional deficiencies. Um, high prevalence of migraine headache, and irritable bowel syndrome. So what's going on in these patients' guts uh, that would cause them to have irritable bowel syndrome? <clears throat> well, you know, it depends on what research we look at. Uh, if we don't look at research, then we just say, oh, you have irritable bowel syndrome. I guess that's your problem. Uh, but if we look at the research, then we look at these patients and we say, oh, you have irritable bowel syndrome. Um, often that's attributed to a condition called bacterial level growth of the small bowel. Um, which is seen in some cases 100% of patients who have uh, fibromyalgia. So uh, I think there's a very tight, tight, tight correlation between bacterial overgrowth of small bowel and uh, fibromyalgia. So Now for the listeners, we've um, done a show on SIBO before, so it's the same thing, it's small intestinal uh, bacterial overgrowth. So I think that's really, yeah. really important. It's really, really yeah. cool that study that you put in your book that, you know, there's 42 patients with fibromyalgia, all 42 of them had SIBO. And, and even right. further, the severity of the bacterial overgrowth was connected with the severity of their symptoms. So that is, like, amazing yeah. evidence. Sure. And it's really, I think sure. it's validating for patients, because I know there's patients listening going, I have pain. People say I'm making it up, but no, this is an actual disease. Yeah, right. And that's why, uh, in one of my YouTube videos, and obviously I discuss this in my book, but I've already put some of the information on the Internet on YouTube. Um, I, I have a whole video on there about the objective abnormality seen in patients with Fibromyalgia, and the importance of that, which I started to allude to a minute ago, is that far too many patients are told, "Hey, this is just in your head," or it's if if it's not caused by your depression and anxiety, it's caused by something that's labeled central sensitization. Uh, which central sensitization means that the brain has just become too sensitive to pain. Uh, does that exist? Yes. Are there animal models for it? Yes. Does it exist in humans? Yes. Does it exist in patients with fibromyalgia? Yes. Is it the cause of fibromyalgia? No. And so there's the distinction. Um, a lot of these patients are told that your brain has just become too sensitive to pain, and I think that's, uh, let's see. So it, it, is, it is actually correct to say that. Their brain has become too sensitive to pain, but that is not the cause of the problem. The cause of the problem is something else that's causing their brain to be too sensitive to pain. And if we just say their brain's too sensitive and we treat them with drugs, then they're going to be on drugs forever. If we say your brain's too sensitive and there's a reason for that, then, of course, we have to treat the reason, um, and, you know, we can do that. 
Would you say the number one cause of fibromyalgia is SIBO? Yeah, if I had to pick one thing, I'd certainly go with that. Um, Again, it goes to the gut. Now, you know, it's all of the gut. Yeah, and it, it doesn't mean that bacterial, you know, small intestine bacterial overgrowth or SIBO, it doesn't mean that small intestine bacterial overgrowth is the only factor because when people have had small intestinal bacterial overgrowth for a while, it changes their biochemistry. It changes their metabolism. It changes the way their brain works. Okay. So, for, you know, let's just look at... Um, Let's just look at central sensitization. So most of the research articles that are published in, and review articles that are published in so-called conventional medical journals, they almost always conclude that it's caused by central sensitization. Uh, and why, why would they say that? Well, it's because the patients have central sensitization. But there's a difference between having something and having a condition caused by it. So what they fail to distinguish is in the, difference, uh, the difference between an association uh, versus a causal relationship versus what's called an epiphenomenon or something that happens along with something else. So how, does, how can we make sense out of any of this? Um, well, at least in my opinion, I made sense of it in, in my book. Uh, but how can we make sense of it briefly and in simple terminology for the sake of this conversation? Uh, let's go back to bacterial overgrowth. So how is it possible that bacterial, bacterial overgrowth in the gut could cause central sensitization in the brain? Well, in animal models, it's been proven that if you expose animals, you know, usually rats, uh, if you expose these animals to bacterial toxins, they develop central sensitization. So, boom, there's your answer. Certain bacterial toxins and metabolites and debris from the gut uh, when it's absorbed at low levels over a long period of time, actually causes the brain to become more sensitive to pain. Okay, how's that for an answer? Uh, okay, well, 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 what would you do? How do you explain the, the muscle biopsy abnormalities? You know, how, do you, how can you explain that? I mean, they've got bacteria in their gut, and now you're saying that their bacteria in their gut are causing uh, abnormalities in their muscle tissue? It's like, come on. Uh, well, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Um, and I say that in the book. So, well, the question becomes, what's, what's being absorbed from the gut to cause abnormalities in the muscle tissue? Well, let's go back to bacterial toxins. So, you know, obviously there are a lot of different bacterial toxins, um, one of which is called uh, LPS or endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide. Those are all the same thing. So uh, one way we can say it's just endotoxin. It's called endotoxin because it's a toxin within the, within the wall of the bacteria. So you can think of it, you can almost say it's an internal toxin. It's called endotoxin with an E. So uh, when animals are exposed to endotoxin from bacteria, they develop central sensitization. When animals are exposed to endotoxin from bacteria, they develop uh, impaired energy production in their muscle tissue. Uh, in fact, very brilliantly, there was a study in humans actually showing that when humans receive uh, a dose of uh, endotoxin, that it impairs their muscle ability to uh, create energy, to create energy in the form of ATP. So what I'm saying here has already been proven in a, in a, in a human model. We're not, talk, we're not talking about animal models that we can extrapolate to human clinical care. We're talking about it's already been shown in humans that this is a cause and effect relationship. Well, I mean, that's all we need. Um, okay, so I'll add one more, and I'll throw the ball back in your court, if, if that's all right with you. So we said, you know, why do these patients respond to antidepressants? And, and why are two out of three of the approved drugs for this condition, they're, they're actually in the antidepressant class, and then there's another drug that works on this neurotransmitter system related to GABA, which is another neurotransmitter. Uh, so how do we make sense of any of that? How, how could we possibly? Uh, well, okay, so I guess we could try to see, is, is there a way for bacteria in the gut to influence neurotransmitter levels within the human brain? Okay, uh, well, of course, my answer is yes. So bacteria in the gut are obviously going to act on whatever's in the gut. And what is in the gut other than, you know, the food that people eat? Uh, 
So I mentioned earlier that these patients often have a deficiency of an amino acid called tryptophan. Well, tryptophan is what the body uses to make a neurotransmitter called serotonin. So if patients start off with low blood levels of tryptophan, then of course they're going to have low levels of uh, serotonin. Um, and further on down the line in, in ways that we can discuss later. So then the question be, so if they have low levels of tryptophan, they're going to have low levels of serotonin in their brain. So then we have established a relationship between nutritional status and brain neurotransmitter levels. So then the question becomes, well, how can we establish a link between bacteria in the gut and a deficiency of tryptophan? Well, that's easy because bacteria in the gut produce an enzyme called tryptophanase, which degrades tryptophan. So here's a very linear model that's very well substantiated. These patients have bacterial overgrowth of the small bowel. They have bacterial overgrowth of bacteria that are uh, degrading the tryptophan that they consume in their diet. So their, their body never even has a chance to absorb the tryptophan. Tryptophan, by the way, of course, was taken off the market by the US FDA uh, several years ago, even though it's an essential nutrient, but I'll let you figure out that one. Um, <laughs> It's a nutrient essential for life, and it was taken off the market by the FDA. Whoa. Okay. Um, All right. So these patients have low levels of tryptophan. Um, in my opinion, that's caused by the bacterial overgrowth of small bowel, because we know several species of bacteria produce this enzyme called tryptophanase, which degrades tryptophan. So these patients might consume tryptophan, but they never have a chance to absorb it. So their blood levels are low. That's well documented. Because of that, they're going to be low in the neurotransmitter serotonin. What would be the effects of low levels of serotonin? Uh, how about depression, anxiety, and pain? Mm -hmm. That's what happens when people are deficient in serotonin. Um, right. Okay, so uh, what else? Let's just take, I'll just take one more small step with that. When patients are def deficient in tryptophan, and therefore they're deficient in serotonin, what else happens? Well, they're deficient in another neurotransmitter hormone called melatonin. And melatonin is necessary for a restful sleep. Well, one of the criteria for the diagnosis of fibromyalgia is unrestful sleep. So there's probably a link there. Furthermore, uh, melatonin is an antioxidant that actually helps mitochondria and muscle tissue produce more energy. So um, a tryptophan deficiency becomes a serotonin deficiency, and a serotonin deficiency becomes a melatonin deficiency. When people are deficient in melatonin, they don't sleep well and their muscles hurt because their muscles can't make enough energy. Perfect. That's how they find them to me. And it's and crazy so, because they all have different symptoms. You know, they're depressed, they can't sleep, they have pain, but it's all the same exact cause and it's right in the gut. I really hope people yeah. can really get, take that away from this show is that you got to get to the root cause, otherwise you're just treating symptoms all day long and you're going to be on medication forever. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> All right, yeah, well, so I mean, that's, the way, that's the way the system is set up. So then, where to go from here? You know, people are listening. They're going, "Oh my gosh, well, it sounds so complicated. What what can I do? What can I possibly do to get relief?" Yeah, well, I think the first, you know, this is kind of touching on my love for psychology and philosophy, but the first answer to any question is approaching the question with the appropriate mindset. So. You know, in this situation, we could look at we could look at fibromyalgia, and we could simply employ common sense, uh, which, believe me, is sorely lacking in healthcare. Uh, one of my definitions for so-called alternative medicine was the clinical application of common sense, and that's why it's considered alternative. You know, because we actually think about things. Um, so, the the most important approach, in my opinion, is to, and this is true for doctors and for patients. But rather than giving up from the outset, which then uh, paralyzes one's intellectual efficacy, and I'll say that in a slightly different way, when people start out from a helpless perspective, they're going to get a helpless result. And the result they're going to come up with is there's no answer. Well, you, can also, you know, a person can also approach problems like this by saying, you know what, I'll bet my life that there's an answer to this problem, and proceed you know, in such a manner that actually exemplifies some confidence, which usually manifests ultimately as competence. So when people believe in themselves, they get, they get things done, you know? 
Um, so, you know, again, for, for doctors, the first thing they have to do is believe that there's an actual cause and that this isn't caused by a drug deficiency. Uh, for patients, the same thing. Believe that there's a cause, and when somebody tells you it's in your head, well, I mean, I'd say walk out, but, you know, you've probably already paid for some of their time. Um, but, you know, I mean, that's what we're taught in medical school. We're taught that there's no, there's no treatment for this, even though there are plenty of research articles showing that there is a treatment for it. So the most important thing is to, you know, arm yourself, number one, with the proper attitude. Uh, there's a, I'll just mention a, a book, uh, which isn't relevant for healthcare per se, but it's relevant for uh, psychology and more specifically for the consulting field. Um, but the title of the book is The Answer to How is Net. Sorry, the answer to how is yes. And what the title of that book implies is that before asking how do we do this or how do we fix this problem, we have to start with the attitude that we will solve this problem. And I realize not everybody does that, but some of us do. So anyway, number one, start with the proper conceptual approach, which is there is an answer to this and it's not drug deficiency. Number two, people have to arm themselves with knowledge, you know. So doctors would have to, you know, Look at the research. You know, I think I've summarized. Uh, I'll let me look at it real quick because I actually have the document right in front of me. Uh, you know, I've looked at 173 different references for my book. Uh, 175, it looks like. And probably more by the time I um, make a, a new update. Not that it'll be that different. It'll just be more details, but it'll be the same protocol. Um, you know, so, you know, you, you can go read 174 articles. Or you could, you know, I might say, you know, buy my book for whatever it costs, <laughs> 20 bucks or something. Uh, and, you know, get informed and, and then don't take no for an answer, you know. It's easy for people to take no for an answer when they don't have anything to back it up. If they go into their doctor's office and say, doctor, I have pain, and the doctor says, oh, well, you have a, a drug deficiency caused by central sensitization and you need to be on this medication the rest of your life, if the patient doesn't know any better, of course they're going to, they have no choice other than to say yes. But if a patient goes in and says, you know, I just bought this book, and right here it says, all I need is X, Y, and Z to cure this problem, and you're my doctor, and I'm requesting X, Y, and Z from you. So either you're going to give it to me, or I'm going to go to a doctor who's going to give it to me. You know? I mean, that's a whole different, that's a whole different conversation. But right. if the doctor's ignorant and the patient's ignorant, they're both going to say, oh, well, let's try medication. Let's just try to relieve your pain. I'm sorry you're in pain. There's nothing we can do about it. You know? Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't buy that for a minute. Absolutely so, not. Yeah. So step number one is the appropriate attitude. Step number two is acquiring the appropriate knowledge, and then you know step number three, of course, is implementing that knowledge. So from a natural natural perspective, you know what? Once they have they have the right mindset, they've really learned about it. What can someone like you or someone like me do to? help restore a person's health when they have fibromyalgia? Yeah. Well, uh, as I'm sure your listeners know, and I'm, I'm sure you've said it before, uh, got to treat that gut, you know. Got to uh, clear out the bacterial overgrowth. And there are, you know, lots of different ways to do that. Uh, diet, vitamin C in high doses on occasion, you know, helps out. Um, Antimicrobials, you know, whether they're botanicals like oregano oil or berberine or artemisia or uh, other fatty acid, other fatty acids like caprylic acid, sometimes those help. Um, sometimes, you know, drugs, antibiotics uh, can certainly be used. In fact, there's quite a bit of research using uh, an antibiotic called the Faximin, mm -hmm. uh, which is a it's a it's a decent drug. Uh, I don't think it's the answer every time. And I would certainly never use it by itself. That's the other problem is even when people try to do the right thing, if they don't do the right thing all the way, then it's like not doing the right thing. So it's not enough to simply treat the gut. I mean, that might help somebody who's only been sick for a few months. But for people who have been sick for a long time, they need more than that. Right. Um, so, yeah, we have to, you know, quote, unquote, treat the gut. What does that mean? Uh, change the diet, change the lifestyle, uh, increase intake of you know, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and berries, because any time we change the diet, we actually change the bacteria in the gut. And, of course, we're trying to change things in a positive direction. So it's not simply giving these patients an antibiotic. We have to change the lifestyle, and that's important. So, for example, you know, a lot of patients have the onset of chronic fatigue syndrome and, and or fibromyalgia after a stressful event. 
Okay, well, what does that have to do with bacteria in the gut? It has everything to do with bacteria in the gut. Because when people are stressed out, it changes the bacteria they have in their guts. Uh, there's a whole field of microbiology these days called uh, microbial endocrinology, which has all to do about how bacteria respond to so-called stress hormones like norepinephrine, uh, and it changes the way the it changes the behavior of the bacteria uh, when they're exposed to stress hormones because the bacteria sense that the host is stressed, and they try to take advantage of that situation by becoming more pathogenic. Hmm. So you know that's why some of us have had the onset of our problems, you know, after a stressful event, and it's because the bacteria kind of take advantage of the situation. So, you know, that's a problem. Um, that's fascinating. So, you know, I think it's really fascinating. You know, someone can have a stressful event, it throws off their gut flora, it becomes more, you know, grown in the abnormal bacteria, and then they have chronic pain. I mean, nobody ever makes yeah. that connection. Nobody thinks something that, that can, you know, something stressful changes their gut and then they have pain. I mean, so that is, that's, Fascinating. Yeah. Well, and it's, you know, kind of like you said earlier, you know, for all due respect for the medical doctors who are out there seeing whatever, 10, you know, somewhere between 6 and 10 patients an hour, they don't have time to figure this stuff out. You know, so the system is actually, well, I mean, the system is designed to impair thinking. And what I'm talking about is the healthcare system itself. When people have to see, you know, somewhere between 6 and 10 patients an hour just to pay the bills, because they're getting reimbursed, you know, whatever, $35 a visit, then it, it forces a fast food mentality, which is I'll take whatever's available right now, and that's going to be a prescription. Doctors don't have to explain it. Uh, patients don't have to think about it. There's no real conversation about changing lifestyle, exp explaining the disease. Just say, oh, you got pain. You meet criteria for fibromyalgia. You have central sensitization, which means your brain is just too sensitive. But I'm going to give you a drug uh, that's going to help your brain be less sensitive, come back in six weeks. I mean, that's yeah. it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. If we were to actually, you know, talk about diet and lifestyle and microbes and, and how that stressful event six months ago triggered this whole thing and, you know, how, you know, eating that, you know, egg muffin sandwich fast food bomb for breakfast is actually contributing to this problem and it's like, hey, you're eating meat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, did you know that that's directly causing this bacterial overgrowth that you have? Um, mm -hmm. You know, because certain foods promote bacterial overgrowth, and wheat is one of them. So, you know, you had asked earlier, is this a condition that we just see more of, or has it always existed? I'm sure it's always existed, at least in some people. But the fact is, if you look at the standard American diet, it's a setup for bacterial overgrowth simply because of all the junk that's in it, junk like sugar, yeah. junk like wheat, um, and not enough fruits and vegetables. So. You know, people don't move their bowels. I had, I had one patient a couple of years ago who had a bowel movement every two weeks. I mean, wow. that is not sufficient. So, yeah. uh, you know, obviously obviously his bowels were a mess. Uh, but, you know, it's lifestyle. He was a truck driver, so. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know. No, so truck driver diet never conducive so, to a bowel movement. <laughs> yeah, so we, we treat the gut. We put them on nutritional supplements to correct their deficiencies. So, uh, you know, too bad we can't use tryptophan now because it's been taken off the market by the Food and Drug Administration. And but nobody does anything about that. You know, I mean, some people protest, but the, you know, most people are like too busy eating donuts and watching television to actually care about what's going on in the world. So you know, they'll let their government rip them off and like, hey, you know, I mean, there should have been protests in the street. Like, hey, you cannot take an essential ingredient, you cannot take an essential nutrient off the market. All right, that is yeah. that is inhumane. But, you know, what do Americans do? They just, you know, most of them are like watching football and drinking beer and, you know, they just say, oh, well, I got pain. I guess I need a drug. You know, I mean, that's what they're taught to believe. So they believe yeah. it and they just fall in line with whatever the, you know, corporate government, um, you know, idea of the day is, which is, oh, these nutrients are dangerous, but you need drugs. Um, yeah. So beyond that, cool. you know, we can use... We can use certain nutrients to kind of, you know, build these patients back up and improve their uh, exercise tolerance and energy production and help restore the mitochondria. So um, the book that I wrote earlier this year on fibromyalgia, which is still current, I mean, it's still accurate. Of course, I'm always updating my material. Uh, the title of that book is called Migraine, Hypo Mig Migraine Headaches, Hypothyroidism, and Fibromyalgia. And it discusses those things because we see those things as a cluster in, in women, who, women and men who have this condition. 
Um, but another book that I'm working on, I actually just published a new book this, today, uh, about two hours Congrats. ago. So, yeah, that's part of the reason why I'm exhausted right now. Uh, the, one of the next books I'm trying to publish uh, is called Mitochondrial Nutrition, which will go into more detail about how we actually have to you know, take care of these mitochondria, uh, which are impaired in patients with, with many different conditions, everything from asthma to Alzheimer's. But so for people who don't know what mitochondria is, what is, what is mitochondria? Yeah, so inside, you know, inside each cell, there are different parts of that cell that do specific jobs, uh, whether it's, you know, metabolizing uh, proteins or fats or carbohydrates or, you know, the, all the DNA, the genetic materials in the nucleus. Um, well, there's another part of, you know, the intracellular space, so to speak, or the, cell, the space within the cell, and it's called a mitochondria. And these are like little organs uh, within the cell uh, that range somewhere between, you know, 200 and 1,000 per cell uh, that actually make energy and make, um, make what's called ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. That's the form of molecular energy that the body uses. So, you know, when we talk about energy, we're usually talking about mood, not necessarily ATP. But when your body thinks energy, your body thinks ATP. That is like the currency of... Uh, molecular uh, activity in the body. So the body must produce ATP for anything to happen. And in patients with fibromyalgia, they don't make enough ATP, which is why they feel fatigued and their muscles hurt. So that's why uh, it was actually through my research in fibromyalgia that I became interested in mitochondria. Um, so that's why I'm writing this book, uh, Mitochondrial Nutrition, which will probably be out in another mm, month or two, depends on how much I sleep. <laughs> Uh, but the mitochondria, you know, have to make ATP, and in patients with fibromyalgia, their, AT, their ATP production is impaired. Uh, you know, so there are certain things we can do to try to improve that. But mitochondrial impairment, or what's more commonly referred to as mitochondrial dysfunction, plays a role in every disease you can think of. Diabetes, mm -hmm. hypertension, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, asthma, I think I already mentioned that. But also all the autoimmune and inflammatory disorders, which is why I published a new book on it today. The new book is called, um, what is the new book called? The new book is called Functional Immunology and Nutritional Immunomodulation. So functional immunology <laughs> will be the, the main title. Because um, it's mostly it's related to, yeah, I know, but you know, i got to call it for how I see it. That's just how I see it. Um, <laughs> so... The, the fact is, I mean, there are a lot of things we can do to treat these inflammatory conditions. And earlier this year, right before I went to Europe to uh, deliver this research, uh, I totally updated my information, and I just published this information today, so it will be available um, obviously later this month. Uh, and that book, as I just mentioned, is uh, Functional Immunology and Nutritional Immunomodulation. It's, about th it's 301 pages to be exact. Uh, and the other book That's has a new title. Yeah, I, I don't know, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm famous for I think it, you so. should just call all your books Brain Candy 1, Brain Candy 2. Yeah, it's, right. It's so well, interesting you know, to read, especially for doctors. I love it. At some point, I'm just going to collect it all together and call it the collected work, the collected papers of Alex Vasquez, you know. Yeah. Um, okay. But, your greatest I mean, hits. by then, yeah, mm -hmm. by then it will be a couple thousand pages. You know, I'm already at, I don't mm -hmm. even know. I mean, I've already reached the limit of my publisher, which is 640 pages. So, <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, I mean, awesome. so, I mean, I've got information out there. People can look me up on the Internet. I've got it on Amazon.com. I have it on my website, which is awesomehealthresearch.com. But, you know, for people who are out of the country, they can just buy it off of Amazon and have it shipped to them. It's really cool. easy. And I, th I, think the I want to make sure... For our listeners who, who, who have just tuned in, if you guys want to call in and ask a question, I'm going to open up to the phone lines for a few minutes. We don't have much time, but 818-495-6919 if you want to ask uh, a question about fibromyalgia, 818-495-6919. I do have a couple questions uh, from Facebook on what sure. I want to get to. So this is from, actually this is from a Twitter. This is Raylene. She wants to know, should one stay away from nightshade veggies and food additives and preservatives, and how does that how does that affect fibromyalgia, yeah. and then and then how does weather affect it as well? So go for it. Oh yeah, how does weather affect it? Well, I mean, people come become more sensitive when they're more fragile. So I mean, what are they going to do? Avoid weather, or you know, try to address the underlying problem that's causing them to be more sensitive? So obviously, I'd vote for the second option. Um, 
and let's see, I'm sorry, what was the, the first part? The first part um, was about nightshade vegetables, and then she also oh, yeah, asked yeah. about food additives and preservatives. Yeah, thank you very much for the reminder. Okay, so nightshade vegetables, no, I don't think people should avoid those foods. There are other things to do. So, you know, any time we look at a question, we have, to, we have to prioritize our answer. Is it possible that a patient will receive benefit by avoiding that particular food? Yes, it's possible. Uh, but is that the top priority? No, it's not the top priority. Um, so I wouldn't avoid nightshades per se, um, but what are the nightshades? You know, tomatoes, well, they have lectins, and sometimes that screws people up. Potatoes, yeah, potatoes should be avoided, but not because they're a nightshade. It's because they promote bacterial overgrowth of small bowel. Uh, red peppers, I, I wouldn't avoid them. Um, but let's go to food sensitivities and food additives. Should food additives be avoided? Absolutely. If it's got a food additive in it, don't eat it. Um, and for those of you who like to drink red wine, you need to be drinking red wine that is organic and sulfite free. And there are several wines out on the market. A wine must be produced, it has to be grown organically and it has to be produced organically in order to be sulfite free. But you'll see some red wines out there, um, some of which I enjoy. Uh, which are sulfite-free. They have no detectable sulfate. So that's very important. So why is that important for patients with fibromyalgia? Well, as an example, sulfites are a mitochondrial toxin. So, you know, when people eat foods, and ironically, there are a lot of drugs out on the market that actually have sulfites in them as a preservative. Um, yeah, so, you know, welcome to being poisoned by your medications, 101. Um, so sulfite is a mitochondrial toxin. It, it, it impairs an enzyme called glutamate dehydrogenase, which, which converts the amino acid glutamate into an um, energy fuel source called succinate. Uh, and it reduces ATP production in human cells by 50%. Hmm. Well, that's not acceptable, uh, especially in patients who already have mitochondrial impairment. So, you know, um, I guess those are some of the things I think about. But yeah, food additives should be off the list. I mean, nobody should yeah. eat food additives, and obviously they shouldn't smoke because, uh, you know, tobacco smoke has a lot of cyanide, and cyanide is another mitochondrial toxin. So, I mean, mm -hmm. if somebody's smoking and drinking, you know, non-organic red wine, then they're loading themselves with mitochondrial toxins, and of course they're going to be sick. Mm -hmm. So so basically if a person already has energy impairment, like mitochondrial impairment, they can't already make the energy, these things are going to make it even worse for them. They're oh, going to feel yeah. even more tired. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. You know, uh, especially if they have right. migraine headaches. Then, I mean, they're tanked. You mm -hmm. know, game over. And a lot, of, a lot of patients, see, a lot of patients know parts of what I'm talking about through their own experience, but they don't know how to put the pieces together. And, and I'm not making them wrong for that. They just, they don't stay up until 4 o'clock in the morning looking at research. And hopefully most mm -hmm. people don't. Uh, but, you know, migraine is a condition associated with mitochondrial impairment. So, why do people have migraine headaches triggered by drinking red wine? Well, it's because the red wine has sulfites, and the sulfites poison their mitochondria, but their mitochondria are already impaired. And so you just push their mitochondria over the brink. Uh, and then they, you know, have impaired ATP production, so they develop this, you know, uh, neurologic condition, otherwise known as migraine headaches. Uh, but it was triggered by having mitochondrial dysfunction that was, already, that was impaired further by the consumption of the sulfites. So, you know, it, when we know the details, then everything starts to make sense, you know. If, right. if we don't know yeah. a lot, then, you know, it's like everything's confusing. It's like, well, why does this happen? And, you know, we come up with ridiculous answers like, uh, you have central sensitization. You need this drug. Um, yeah, I'm not buying it. Yeah. Well, a little more to the picture. All right, and then last question from Facebook. This is from Sage. She wants to know, and this might be a little over people's heads if they're not, I know he's a, he's a doctor, so he's wondering about MT, HFR, and fibromyalgia. So if you can just kind of explain that in layman's terms, that would be awesome. Oh, yeah, well, um, okay, so what is MT, HFR? Uh, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. So that's an enzyme that converts, uh, it, it's active in a certain pathway for using folic acid to metabolize these certain uh, amino acids like methionine and cysteine and homocysteine. So when people have a defect in that pathway, uh, they're not able to metabolize amino acids and they're not able to transfer what on a 
chemical level are called methyl groups and et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's pretty complicated. But let's look at it from its most, most simple. Um, from its most simple view, we could say that those patients have an impairment in their body's ability to use folic acid. Okay, so how would that be relevant for fibromyalgia? Well, patients with fibromyalgia, as I mentioned before, have a defect uh, in their serotonin pathways. Uh, and the defect, you know, at least uh, among its many causes, is the fact that they don't have enough tryptophan to make serotonin. So that pathway has already taken a, a hit. Their serotonin pathway is already injured. And now if we add another defect, like um, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, which is seen in 10% of the population, um, if we add that defect on top of a defective pathway, then it's going to be impaired even more, and folic acid is necessary for neurotransmitter production um, serotonin utilization. So it's, you could look at a patient in that sense as having two hits. They've taken two injuries to the same pathway. Uh, so their neurotransmitter production and utilization is going to be impaired um, from a biologic standpoint, which we already reviewed for the bacterial overgrowth causing the tryptophan deficiency, but also, um, you know, if they have this gene defect, which is seen in at least 10% of the population, uh, then they're going to have an impairment in that pathway, which makes things worse. Not to mention the fact that they could have, you know, other nutritional deficiencies as well. Mm -hmm. Very well so, explained. That was awesome. So if a person has this particular gene defect, is there anything they can do, or is it just, okay, I have this gene defect, and therefore I can't make folic acid? Yeah, they probably need to be on drugs. Um, I'm sure there's a drug out there for this. That's, of course, a joke. Um, yeah, well, you need to take they need to take more folic acid, for one thing. Um, and there are different forms of folic acid. There's folic acid, which is synthetic. There's folinic acid, which works pretty well. And then there's methylated folic acid, which just bypasses the whole defect uh, in total. So yeah, they could, they could you know, they could use uh, methylated um, folic acid, um, you know, five milligrams a day or something like that would, would not be unreasonable and certainly safe. Uh, if they're going to use that much, um, if they're going to use that much folic acid, then they should be on B12 at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, because B12 and folic acid work together, and they should be on the B complex. And of course, they should be on a healthy diet and taking vitamin D and fatty acids and probiotics. So, I mean, you know, everything works together. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a it's a miracle that any nutritional study could show benefit because they always use one nutrient at a time when people actually have multiple nutritional deficiencies. So, I mean, the fact that you know, we see benefit is, is a miracle in itself because these people have multiple nutritional deficiencies. Uh, and since all nutrients work together, then, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a snowball's chance in hell that one nutrient would help them. But, you know, fortunately it does. Yeah, but yeah not a magic acid, bullet. Yeah. Yeah, there's no magic bullet. There's a, the only thing that's magic is the magic lifestyle, you know? Like yeah. There is a magic lifestyle, and there's a magic yeah. perspective and a magic paradigm and a magic philosophy and psychology of approaching life, you know? And people have to approach it from the standpoint that they have power, and they can figure things out. So if a doctor starts with low self-esteem or this, you know, general sense of helplessness, then those doctors are going to be the ones who say, oh, well, there's nothing we can do. I guess you need this drug. But, you know, if a doctor actually has an attitude, you know, you know it's called an attitude, right? It's like, no, I don't, have to, I don't have to put up with this. I can figure this thing out. You know, we, those are people who are, like, labeled, you know, insubordinate. Well, yeah, they're not some subordinating to stupidity. Um, and so, you know, they're the ones who figure things out. Um, you know, and that's how progress is made in humanity. So there it is. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, all you guys listening, it's not a magic bullet. Like we said, it's a magic lifestyle. If this is something that you're suffering with, you know someone who's suffering with it, really look at the root cause. You know, look at that gut. Talk about, you know, really address these, these nutrient deficiencies, vitamin D, these different vitamins and minerals. Look at thyroid function and deal with the infections. And, it, it's, again, it's not, it's not one thing. It's not a drug deficiency that you have. It's, it's a whole lifestyle approach that's going to be really necessary to, to turn this thing around. Work with a doctor who can address the root cause, you know? Contact Dr. Vasquez, contact myself, read these books. I really, ev everyone listening to this, I want you to read a book called Breaking the Vicious Cycle. It's addressing this root cause. One of the, one of the root causes of fibromyalgia, I'll say that, because it's not necessarily the root cause, but very, very commonly found with fibromyalgia. 
read this book, Breaking the Vicious Cycle by Elaine Gottschall, and it addresses this, the diet that's for SIBO. You know, and if that can't address it, then you know, look at some naturopathic treatments and, and get this thing resolved because you don't have to suffer. You don't have to be in pain forever. You, there is relief. You can not feel depressed you know, anymore. You can get sleep. There, there is an answer out there for you. So I know a lot of you guys are suffering, but I really want you to see this, see this on the bright side. You know, you're learning, you're educating yourself, and, and there's some answers out there for you. So Dr. Vasquez, anything else you want to address before we, we wrap up? Is there anything else we missed? Mm -hmm. No, just, uh, you know, if people want my info, they can, you know, buy the book, um, Migraine Headaches, Hypothyroidism, and Fibromyalgia. It's on Amazon.com. Like I said, it's only like 25 bucks. So, you know, I was just trying to get the information out there. It's um, fabulous. But, the book is fabulous. Yeah, I love the work yeah, you're doing. I mean, geez, 10 bucks? Come on now. <laughs> yeah, it pretty much lays it out. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, today, yeah today was the 10th book, I think. Um, wow. So, yeah, I've been pretty busy. So, no, I gotta I'll celebrate. Follow. Yeah, I know. Well, I gotta get some sleep. So, uh, I'll get some, <laughs> no, celebrate I gotta, with some sleep. I actually have to do another seminar tomorrow morning. So, uh, no rest for the weary. Yeah, seriously. All right. Very good. Very good. All right, y'all. Check out his website, Optimal Health Nutrition. Is that right? Optimal. OptimalHealthResearch.com. Uh, Optimal I actually Health do Research.com. Yeah, I have that other site as well. I just don't use it very much. So. Uh, but OptimalHealthResearch.com is where, that's the site that I update, and it's got the newest information about my books and such. Okay. I love it. Well, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. Again, I don't invite a lot of guests back, so I feel honored, you know. You're really All right. pretty pretty yeah, amazing. Well, so thanks again. <laughs> thank you. Like, and the fact that we're friends actually helps too, right? Don't I, don't I, don't I get to be on the A-list? <laughs> yeah, for sure. You get the VIP. You're on the VIP list. Right, right. <laughs> All right, Doc. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Take care. All right. Bye. Thanks for tuning in, you guys. Check out those books. Check out the website. Um, also, check me out, drlaurennoel.com, and mark your calendars for next next week's show. I'm talking all about addictions, sugar addiction, alcohol, drugs. We're going to talk all about it from a psychological perspective, what, what can be done. So tune in. If you know anybody with some addictions, like all of us, I think we're all addicted to something, check out that show. It's with Pam Colleen, she's the author of the book um, Addictions. And uh, definitely stay in the loop. If you uh, want to check out any other shows, go to iTunes in the podcast directory, type in Dr. Low Radio, and you'll find any previous shows. I think we've done like 50, 60 shows now. There's a really good list of things you can learn about anything, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, what, whatever, we got it for you. Um, and, you know, spread the word. We're in the top five, I think, out of like 1,300 shows. We're doing really well. So, again, thanks for the listens. Thanks for the questions. And we will check you next week. All right. Bye.